Wow. Okay, I'm going to play with this interesting microphone. It always gives me grief. So we're going to move it out. And we're going to get taller. Watch, watch this miracle. Things can be changed. Evidence right there. <laughs> well, welcome. Those of you who are tuning in from all around the world, all around Fort Worth, all around Texas, great to have you with us by internet, now, later, whenever. But those of you who had the courage to come out today and be here in person, welcome. It's great to be with you. I get to say things today that I've been holding on to for the longest time. So, you know, the game starts at three. We got plenty of time, right? <laughs> so, I want to share, thanks for Tom, for the invitation to be here today. It's great to be with you. I think of you all as my family. Not the family of my birth, but the family of my choosing. And I have such great love and admiration for all of you and your different places and your journey and your stories. They're just incredible. And so I'm going to share some of my story with you today so you can know a little bit more about me as one of the clergy here at first. I'm the Disciple Church Associate Pastor, and, and I love to help out whenever I have the chance because I love this church. It's been a huge factor in my life. So I'm grateful for many, many things that prepared me to be here at this moment in time, at this place, here with you today. So it's, it's just a joy for me. So if you read Tom's email that he sends out every week, did y'all read that? Anybody? I, yeah. I read it every week. And you have a clue that my story hasn't been all sunshine and roses. And that's okay. I can say that because I've had therapy. <laughs> But I'm going to be real with you today. I'm going to be vulnerable. And even though it's not comfortable because we are family of faith, I'm going to tell you some truth about my story and what I've learned as I've come along this road. So as I begin, I want to start with my family in Louisiana. Yes, I'm a Louisiana girl. I got here in Texas as quick as I could. And we, my family of origin, faithfully attended another church, another denomination, Southern Baptist Church, all of my life. If the doors were open, we were there. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I was baptized at First, United, uh, sorry, First Baptist Church of Ruston, Louisiana, when I was just nine years old. And my mom was a Sunday school teacher. My, my whole family was just, we were Baptist to the core. And... When I was 18, my parents went through a very ugly divorce. And because of my upbringing in the church, I had internalized. You know, we all had this embedded theology. The stuff that we believe, whether we have really thought about it or not, it's what, kind of what we have absorbed growing up. And I just had this sense, because of what I'd been taught through the years, that God was exclusively male, totally paternal, and most of the time kind of angry and ready to punish just like that. So I didn't have a real cool sense about uh, this loving experience of faith. And so when my dad left, because God is father and daddy and all that stuff, it all got really messed up with abandonment and the struggle of what does it mean to be loved and to be accepted, but then be left behind. And it was a very painful time, right as I was beginning college. It was a tough road. And I saw how that impacted me, obviously, but I also saw how it had an impact on my mother and our family and how changed we all were by that brokenness. Well, as I went through the, the years of, of study and and growth and learning in college. It was such a, a time of, of struggle, just, just hard. And then um, I remember leaving um, to go to a, a Baptist college from where I had originally started out and not doing well at all. I went to Louisiana College and I got a scholarship to sing in common good on scholarship. It was, a, it was a lovely experience. We traveled around to all the different Baptist churches trying to get them to give money to the school, you know, one of those kind of things. And it was a really fun way to, to help give back, I suppose. 
but over and over again, that, that image of God that I had been taught was re- reiterated. And, and I swear we sang just as I am so many times that I thought the blood was going to flow down the aisle as we were, you know, washed in the blood of the lamb. And I just thought, good grief. Is this all there is? Sin and judgment and punishment. And it was hard to think of that. And it was hard to hurt and not feel comforted. Well, I'm going to fast forward a few years. And prior to my dear husband, David, who's here today, I have not been lucky in love. My first love was in college at the Baptist Louisiana College where I attended. And he convinced me that our friendship could be something much more. He was a music major in college studying music ministry, and I was an education and music major. And we ended up getting married after college. And, and initially, things were going pretty well, and then um, we had a lot of conflict, a whole lot of conflict real quick. And uh, we moved to New Orleans for him to attend the Baptist Seminary there, and things really began to unravel in our relationship. And I learned pretty quickly, I'm going to make this family friendly, so don't worry, parents. I discovered that he liked boys a lot more than girls. And I don't know if you noticed, I'm a girl. So it was problematic for our relationship. And really, it was a deal breaker. But I wasn't prepared to walk away from a vow that I made in a church where there's just not a lot of grace for things like that. So I tried to remain Baptist, but I ended up leaving New Orleans and leaving the marriage when his therapist, who was helping him with sexual addiction, told me that I was not safe, that he was being very dangerous and putting me at risk. And I determined that God did not expect me to die to honor that vow. So I began the process of removing myself from that very toxic relationship. And I moved back to Pineville, July 5th, 1994, totally broken, totally feeling like a failure, a devastation, feeling like nothing about life had worked the way I had planned. And I remember getting on my mother's sofa in my pajamas, and for three days I stayed there, and I cried, and I prayed, and I, I tried to figure out how God could allow this to happen to me. And then I got a phone call that sort of changed my perception. I got a phone call from the pastor's wife of the church where he served in Mississippi, to convince me to go back home and be a dutiful wife and to forgive him for whatever had happened and, and just go do the right thing. And I told her, you have no idea what you're asking of me, and I have no intention of going back. And then my grief process began to change from depression to anger. And I got in touch with this ugh, this righteous indignation that I didn't have to be a victim anymore. And I was choosing intentionally not to let that be my identity. But it was not an easy thing. It's kind of like being in a deep well and looking up for light. So, somehow, I got off the couch. (laughs) I took a shower. (laughs) I got dressed and started my life again, looking for a job, trying to figure out, well, what's next after all of this? And I remember the scene from Gone with the Wind. I don't know if y'all remember this. Scarlett O'Hara says, As God is my witness, I will never be hungry again. 
and she decides to return to her home and, and start life over. I felt that kind of resolute determination to survive. I don't know where it came from. I don't know if it was my pajama prayer from the couch or just my survival instinct, but somehow I determined that I've got to make it through this and life can be good again. And so I started thinking, well, where do I want to live in the world? Because now I'm free to choose. And so I decided to move to what was then my happy place. I have always loved the beach, the Texas coast. And so I applied for a job in Galveston as a school teacher, and I got the job. And so I found an apartment right on Seawall Boulevard, and I moved to Galveston. Our family had vacationed there my whole life growing up, and it was just a new start. I was free. I was free of criticism. I was free of living by the consequences of someone else's choices. I was free to be healthy and to be me and to decide where in the world am I and how am I going to be who I'm meant to be. It was a new start. And I believed that I had been given this opportunity for change, even though it was hard. And so I started taking care of myself. I started walking on the seawall after school every day, and I started getting in shape and feeling good and looking better, and I started eating right and just doing all the things that people do when they're healthy. <laughs> well, then I decided, well, I need to find a church. So, of course, I went to the church of my upbringing, and it was just an, an experience of judgment and awfulness. I just can't tell you how painful it was to go and feel judged as a stranger in this town where I knew no one. So I then um, visited Moody Memorial First United Methodist Church. And that's where my spiritual life began again. I attended a new member class where I learned about grace in the Methodist tradition and the quadrilateral of faith, scripture, reason, tradition, and experience, right? I learned about the sense of God's love that is greater than even my brokenness. And then that fall, about this time that year, 94, I, d I attended a divorce recovery workshop. And I was invited to forgive the person who had hurt me. And I did it. Now, it didn't mean I forgot what happened. <laughs> I still had a lot to learn about why all that took place in my life. But the healing was happening, is my point. And I fin followed up with counseling at the Samaritan Center, and hope returned over and over again. And those four years in Galveston were, for me, a, a real rebirth. So I think of myself as having been born first from the waters of the womb, from my mother. But my real rebirth happened in the waters of the Gulf, the salty waters of the Gulf of Mexico. And I love that place still. So... In those years in Galveston, I was teaching school, and I, I was thinking, I want to do more with my life. I, I just don't know what that needs to look like. I, I, I'm just not fulfilled with this. I want to do more. And so a lady in my choir, she, she came to me after church one Sunday, and she said, Mary Ellen, I don't know what's going on in your life, but you just have so much potential. And if you feel like... God is working in your life somehow. Just, just go talk to our pastor. And so I made an appointment, and I went to talk to Charles Milliken. And the only time he had open was Good Friday that year. So we met on Good Friday at noon in his office. And I told him kind of about what I was feeling and thinking and, and how grateful, just totally grateful I was that I had the opportunity to start life over again and to 
to determine what that needed to look like. And, and he said, Mary Ellen, what I hear you saying sounds to me, correct me if I'm wrong, sounds to me like a call to ministry. And I could not imagine that that was what's going on. Because <laughs> I just, I didn't feel worthy. How could God be doing that in my life? And he said to me, if you decide that that is what's happening, and it's up to you, and if you decide to surrender to that sense of, of call, then our church will give you a full scholarship to go to Perkins School of Theology at SMU. And I decided that call sounded real good. <laughs> So that August, I packed my stuff in a U-Haul trailer, and I moved to Texas, Dallas, Texas. And it was another rebirth. <laughs> Talk about challenging your embedded theology. Whoa, did I ever have to unpack all the stuff that I had learned and I'm still unpacking and still growing and still changing as I continue to live in this life. But some four years later, in 2002, I graduated from Perkins and I became a hospital chaplain right here at Harris Methodist Hospital in Fort Worth. And so that was my beginning here in Fort Worth. And I joined this big old church downtown called First United Methodist. In 2000, I began my journey here. Dan, uh, Dr. Day was our pastor then, and I remember going to the uh, service right after 9-11 and how hard that time was in our country. And, and I remember working through all the changes that have happened in my own life through this time and figuring out how people endure suffering. And I, and I have a few thoughts about that I want to share briefly. I have read recently Elizabeth Lesser's book, Broken Open, How Difficult Times Can Help Us Grow. And she writes, How strange that the nature of life is change. Yet the nature of human beings is to resist change, right? And how ironic that the difficult times that we fear might ruin us are the very ones that can break us open and help us blossom into who we were meant to be. Interesting way of interpreting brokenness, isn't it? Now, I don't like that it's true. I'll just tell you that right now. I don't like that suffering brings change that might be actually a good thing for me. I hate that. I don't want that. As human beings, we're conditioned to maintain homeostasis, right? That's how we feel safe. But we can be sure that times will come in our human experience that are difficult. This is truth, right? We've experienced it. When we are broken, and I didn't say if, did I? When we are broken. <laughs> the question becomes, how am I going to respond to this? What will I do with this? Are we going to be defeated and bitter and resentful and unforgiving? Or will we be open and broken, <laughs> transformed, ready to become something new and different? Well, when I was a girl, one of my favorite TV shows was The Six Million Dollar Man. It came out in 1974. I am that old. Yes. Do you remember that show? It was awesome. This uh, astronaut, very handsome, hmm, very athletic. He was flying his, uh, his spacecraft back into the you know, atmosphere of the Earth, and he crashed. And rather than let him die from his catastrophic injuries of both legs, his right arm and an eye, the team of, of medical scientists put his body back together again with bionic parts that were nuclear-powered bionic parts. So when he recovered and went through rehab, suddenly he was recovered unlike any other human being. He could run 60 miles an hour with those bionic legs. He could see like an eagle can see. 
not a human. And then he was obligated to pay off his $6 million bill by working as a secret agent. Great story. Kind of reminds me of Iron Man of this, of this time frame. But the thing I remember about that show is at the beginning of every series, it said this, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. Y'all remember that? Gosh, I love that. The, cha- the place where I work as a chaplain at Clear Fork Hospital, we make bionic men and women every day now. We put titan- titanium knees in there. We put steel rods and plates and pieces in their hips that are broken. And they get up and they walk again the very next day. It's amazing. Change can be for the better, but it's not easy. I want to show you a picture. Um, there's something called kintsugi. Have you all heard of this? It is called kintsugi. It's a Japanese art form, and you see a picture of it there. You see those little lines of gold? That is a bowl that was broken into pieces, rendered unusable, and by most standards, thrown away. But in the hands of the artist, they take lacquer, and gold powder, and they put that bowl back together again so that it's not only different and unique from any other bowl that ever was, it's more valuable, more beautiful. And it emphasizes the places of brokenness as places of beauty. There's a lesson there for human beings. And it goes like this. What can Kintsugi teach us? We don't expect other people to be perfect, but we expect ourselves to be perfect, don't we? We don't like our vulnerabilities, and we certainly don't want to show them to other people. We want to hide our wounds, our mistakes. We want to cover them up because of the shame and embarrassment that we feel. But guess what? We're all fallible. We all make mistakes, we heal, we grow, we get broken, we heal and we grow again, and we survive somehow the blows that happen to our ego, to our reputation, to our life, to our body, and we keep living. But if you can embrace those places of brokenness, they can become places of strength and beauty. When it's appropriate, Exposing vulnerabilities, admitting errors, it creates intimacy and trust between human beings. Another lesson we can learn is that though we're often relieved when others are truthful, we're so afraid to expose ourselves and to be vulnerable. But when we consider how other people's honesty about their flaws is a positive thing, we can admit that we too have experienced brokenness. Now, here's why that's hard. Whenever I hear about your pain, it's an abstraction. But when I think about my pain, it's very concrete. I can go back there in a moment. But you may not be able to relate to what hurt me. It's an abstraction. And that's okay. As long as we understand that our imperfections are gifts that we can work with, not shames to be hidden. I've heard it said many times in surgery at the hospital. What's the difference between minor surgery and major surgery? Have y'all heard this? If it's minor, it's happening to you. If it's major, it's happening to me. (laughs) I don't care if it's a toenail repair. (laughs) It's major surgery if I'm on the table. And finally, Kintsugi Kintsugi teaches us that we can turn the ordinary into extraordinary. And sometimes that happens through terrible accidents, through breaks and hurt, and everything that happens in this life. Nothing is wasted It's all an opportunity, the good, the bad, the ugly, to serve as opportunities for change. So, as I close today, I want to tell you about a story that Nita shared with me earlier. 
It's a story called The Wing by Ray Buckley, and it says this. The people of the forest, and this is a Native American story. The people of the forest are amazed by the beauty and the swiftness of she who flies swiftly. <laughs> Isn't that cute? She's like a bright jewel among the leafy trees, and one day they find her, tragically, lying on the forest floor with a broken wing. And suddenly the creator is there holding her in his hand, and afterward the others wait for her to fly, but she can't fly anymore. And they don't understand. The creator came, but didn't she experience healing to fly again? But she didn't. Finally, they leave her, and in her sorrow, she begins to sing. And the song becomes more and more beautiful. And her voice is joined by the creator and the other forest creatures. And beauty, like none had experienced before, result from her experience of brokenness. I want to share with you as I close, remember the words of Leonard Cohen. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. There are so many examples of beauty that results from brokenness. Whether you think about sea glass that started as broken glass in the water, churned by the surf and the salty water of the sea to become this beautiful, smooth stone. Whether you think about looking through the hole of a kaleidoscope to see the shards of glass that make beautiful shapes. They're broken. Whether you think about stained glass windows put back together with the metal joinery or bionic body parts <laughs> or the crack in the concrete sidewalk where a stubborn weed flows up and blooms with a beautiful flower. In your life, in mine, by some incredible mystery, we are being transformed. And yeah, we're broken, but we are beautifully broken. <laughs>